Good morning. Welcome to chapel at the Institute of Lutheran Theology. Timothy J. Swenson here, Dean of Chapel at the Institute. And it is good to be with you today as we bring you our featured chapel service from our studio in Brookings, South Dakota. As we begin this day, let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join with me in our litany. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mind. In the way of your testimonies I delight. As much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Join with me in the prayer of the day. Father in heaven, you have redeemed us by sending us messengers to preach Christ to us so that he would be our life. We confess our failure to be such messengers in return. So keep us steadfast in your word of promise that we may speak it to others as your Holy Spirit gives us voice. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The word of the Lord, according to the book of Hebrews, the fifth chapter. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices as for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sin just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The Word of the Lord. Greetings to you. Greetings on this day that the Lord has made a day for us to rejoice and be glad Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the days of his flesh, although he was a son, he learned to hear rightly through what he suffered. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who rightly hear him after the order of Melchizedek. Here at the Institute of Lutheran Theology, we have been formally accepted as an applicant for accreditation by the Association of Biblical Higher Education. Accordingly, we are revisiting our purpose statement and our mission statement. The verses we have from Hebrews today deliver to us such distinctions in regards to the high priestly office 
they tell us of its purpose and of its qualifications. Every high priest receives his office for one purpose, to act on behalf of humanity. Specifically, on behalf of other human beings just like himself. The high priest deals with God on account of sin. Gifts given, sacrifices made, so that the forgiveness of sins may be handed over to his fellow humanity, specifically the ignorant and the wayward. The high priestly office has a purpose to do for others, particularly in dealing with sin. The high priestly office has two qualifications, compassion and call. The high priest deals compassionately with the ignorant and the wayward because he himself is beset with weakness. The second qualification, call, is divine appointment. No one merely assumes the office of high priest for himself, but is set in it by God. After setting forth the purpose and qualifications, our word today goes on to specifically apply them to Jesus as our high priest. Unlike the practice in Jerusalem under Roman rule, Jesus does not exalt himself or put himself forward to be high priest. When the Romans ruled in Jerusalem, the governors controlled the priestly vestments, and they chose who would occupy the office, choosing from among the candidates put forward by the various rival factions. The office was often given to the most lucrative, the most powerful, or the least troublesome candidate. Jesus did not exalt himself continuing the practice established in the case of Aaron, he was called by God. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. After applying that first qualification of call to Jesus, our high priest, the word today then takes up the second qualification, compassion. Jesus has the ability to sympathize with humanity. In considering these concluding verses 7 through 10 of our lectionary passage, many, many have seen in their emotionally moving language and passionate intensity the remnant of an early Christian hymn. Adapted here, for our writer's use. A possible reconstruction would give us two three-line strophes, something like this. He offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. He was heard for his godly fear, being made perfect, being designated by God, a high priest. Jesus cried out to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard, but still he died. He was made perfect. To which our author then makes his own comments in the days of his flesh. Although he was a son, he learned to hear rightly through what he suffered he became the source of eternal salvation to all who rightly hear him after the order 
of Melchizedek. The Father, here's the Son, and the Son, here's the Father. All three of these words, being heard, obedience, and obey, are all based on the same root word, akuho, hearing, so that Jesus can fulfill the purpose of the high priestly office and act on behalf of others for the forgiveness of sins. He was called and made compassionate. Even his sonship did not exempt him from these qualifications. God heard him, and he heard God. His call, his call put him, inserted him, exposed him, established him right in the world, in the days of his flesh. Those days had only one end, the end of all flesh, death. That is the end announced by Jesus to the twelve in our gospel reading for this appointed Sunday. Jesus tells how the high priests and scribes in Jerusalem will take him and mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. So you, you who also in the days of your flesh, you know there is only one end, the end of all flesh, death. You have these days of your flesh in common with the one who is your high priest. So you, you who are caught up here at the Institute of Lutheran Theology, caught up in purpose and qualifications, raising up the next generation of preachers to deliver the work of our high priest, Jesus Christ, to their hearers. So you, in the days of your flesh, also know the qualifications of call and compassion, the act of being called and being made compassionate. Both are functions of hearing. You will not hear the call, nor will you learn compassion, if you do not have ears to hear. That is the most frequent admonition of Jesus. Let the one with ears hear. Perhaps Jesus meant it as more than an admonition, but also as a prayer, a prayer that God, with the, as the one with true ears, would hear, hear him. So there was this time when Ole sought out a consultation with the family doctor. He was concerned for Lena's hearing, and their doctor told him about a little test Ole could do. It consisted of him speaking normally to Lena from across the room and then advancing gradually toward her, repeating the statement until Ole heard her respond to him. The next day, Lena was cooking at the stove and Ole came into the kitchen. He stopped and asked what she was doing. No response. He moved closer, asked again. No response. He moved closer and asked again. And then, hearing no response, he moved right up behind her and asked a fourth time. And Lena turned to him, saying, I've already told you three times. It's rumagrupt. In these, the days of our flesh, contemplating the end of those days, sinners assume that their God 
is the one with poor hearing. Please, prayers, supplications, entreaties for deliverance appear to go unheard. Our days of flesh still have suffering, still end with death. God's hearing of our prayers, though, does not require our being spared such suffering, nor does it require our being spared the end common to all flesh. All our ability to pray, all of those acts through which sinners test their God's hearing, all rest upon the divine reality that God is neither deaf nor absent. Our Lord remains faithful, a sustaining and answering reality, giving giving to those who have ears to hear. He is the Lord who heard Jesus, heard him and raised him from the dead, not allowing him to make the detour around death. So too, we, you and I, expect that same resurrection, that same denial of the detour around death. The same Father who hears his Son, Jesus Christ, speaks to us so that we too may learn obedience. That is, learn to hear and hear rightly. Learn to live from the Word and the Word alone. The same Father who hears his Son, Jesus Christ, and makes of him eternal salvation of all sinners who so learn to hear. That Father forgives the sins of those who have ears to hear. To you, in these days of your flesh, in these days of your suffering unto death, these are the days of your hearing. Hearing your call, hearing so that you will be compassionate, not driven to bitterness by your troubles, not driven to triumphalism in your victory over them, but entering into them, accompanied and driven by the Word of God, so that you will be compassionate, being made perfect. These, the days of your flesh and the days of your hearing, are the days of faith, the days of word and word alone. God give you ears to hear. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, use these days of our flesh to give us ears to hear, that we might may be made compassionate and know our call. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, take us from temptation, the temptation of our own wisdom and strength, the temptation of our name's glory over yours, the temptation to hoard our daily bread, the temptation to forget the confession of our sin and the reception of forgiveness. Take us from such temptation. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father in heaven, grant to those of us at the Institute of Lutheran Theology sufficient discernment that we may define our purpose and mission appropriately. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Father in heaven, grant to our students and faculty the work of your Holy Spirit to open their ears that they too would know their purpose and fulfill their qualifications. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Father in heaven, so work upon those who are facing great persecution and, and injustice, that their hearts remain pure in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father in heaven, grant that ILT continues to become a community of forgiven sinners, going about the business of proclaiming the good news of abundant mercy and forgiveness given at the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. <laughs>